Today's guest is Yuri Elkheim. Yuri believes new coaches and health entrepreneurs starting out should do three things in order. Number one, create an impactful coaching product that gets results. Number two, use paid advertising to get these clients in the door and get results for them. Number three, then ride the wave of all your organic traffic flow. Building a business from scratch with just organic, aka accidental, marketing efforts can work, but it may take ages. Paid traffic gets you found more quickly than organic. Let's learn all about it. Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. All right, Yuri, we are excited to have you. How are you today? I'm well. Thanks for having me, ladies. Great to be here. Oh my gosh, we love to get into all this stuff. Health entrepreneurship. This is right in our wheelhouse. We love it. We could talk about it all day, but we won't keep you all day. We promise. But we like to start every interview with your origin story, but we want you to tell it. I'm not going to read your bio here. We want you to tell our audience kind of who you are, where you started, how you got here. So I started off as a young kid wanting to play pro soccer. That was my goal from like 10 years old. And I dedicated all my teenage years to, to training and playing and doing my best to get there. So I was very fit growing up, uh, but I didn't realize that I was pretty unhealthy. And that didn't really hit home until I lost all of my hair to an autoimmune condition when I was 17. And that was a big wake-up call for me. So between that and then my passion for fitness, it really kind of started this journey into health uh, that became you know, what I do now. So I was able to play uh, pro soccer in my early 20s, which is awesome. But I also spent that time starting to investigate like how, like what's going on with the hair, like how can I get it back? And I went to school at the University of Toronto for kinesiology, um, came back and went to school for holistic nutrition afterwards. And that changed my life uh, because I I didn't realize how big a part nutrition plays Mm -hmm. in our health until I realized how big it plays. And then within the space of a couple of weeks, clean up my diet, got rid of all the garbage, uh, regrew my hair in the space of about two months. And long story short, Obviously, I lost it again 10 years later, got a tetanus booster, and my hair fell out again, whatever. Oh, so boy. anyways, the 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 eye-opening information I was learning about with nutrition was just, I'm like, okay, I played pro soccer. I went to one of the top schools in the world for kinesiology, and I still didn't know this stuff. Mm-hmm. There must be billions of people who have no clue about this. And I just, I just became pissed off and inspired to want to share with as many people as possible. So that's really where it started. And then I was at the time, I was also training clients as a personal trainer. And I thought this the nutrition stuff would be really good for them. And so I started bringing that all together. Um, but I was doing that for, you know, the one on one stuff in person for about seven years, got pretty burnt out. I was also working as the strength and conditioning coach at the University of Toronto as a volunteer. So that was like an extra 20 hours a week. And I was getting to a point where I was just like, I got a this, I can't keep sustaining this. So yeah. 2005, I came online. I thought, you know what? I'm tired of people. I'm going to write an ebook and live the laptop lifestyle. <laughs> and that didn't happen. That didn't happen at all. So, <laughs> three years living on poverty line income, trying to figure out how to do this online thing. I was selling ebooks and workout programs and stuff like that. And in 2010, I was like, hey, dude, you're not as smart as you think you are. Maybe you should get some help. And I hired my first coach and started going to events and learning stuff I needed to learn. And that became the inflection point in the business. And we went on to build the business to uh, multiple seven figures, you know, helped half a million customers around the world, uh, wrote a New York Times bestselling book, was doc- you know, all the nonsense, like Dr. Oz, the doctors, all the stuff that people think is cool and like uh, a sign of success. So I'm happy I did all that stuff. Um, but about, I'd say 13 years into the business, so this is about five years ago now, I decided to sell it, even though it's my name. Because it was just way too complex. It was just way too complex. And during that process, even before, a lot of other health and fitness professionals building their businesses online were asking me for advice because they're like, hey, dude, like, what have you done to build this business? Can I pick your brain? And this kept happening over and over again. And I thought, hold on, there's an opportunity here because there's a lot of amazing health professionals 
who have amazing knowledge to help people, but they can't bridge the gap to reach them. Yeah. And so that's where Healthpreneur, our current business, really birthed out of. And our goal really is to bridge the gap and to equip health entrepreneurs, practitioners, coaches with the marketing and business acumen they need to reach and impact the people they want. And so that's, so I kind of moved away from like to the consumer side of things. And now obviously over the past number of years, focusing more on health professionals and coaches, if we can help them build better businesses online, they can help more people collectively. We all help more people. And that's, that's kind of the journey in a nutshell. Hmm. There's so many, I have so many questions. I have mm-hmm. so many follow-up, yeah, follow-up yeah. questions. <laughs> um, but I'll start with the, um, I'll sort of frame up the the big one, which is, so as educators, Laura and I are educators of health coaches. We train in, and certify health coaches who then go off to do big things. And just like you, and just like all of us, we had this health transformation that made us angry and we want to scream it from the rooftops and help people make an impact. And that's that's honestly the the origin of, I think, almost everybody who gets into this line of business. But then where they fall down is, I don't know where to find clients. And we hear that verbatim from our students. Okay, I'm certified. Yeah. Where's the clients? Where do I find <laughs> clients? How do I find clients? Like, we get that question. I know, obviously, you do too. You got people sliding into your DMs, like, help me out here. But like, the question of how do I find clients? Mm-hmm. I can't even count how many times I've heard it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Yuri, how do you find clients? <laughs> Did well, I think this, I, I think the secret is they have to find you. And yes, if you set up your business in you. such a way where you can put yourself in front of them so they can find you, that makes it a lot easier. I think the dilemma in our space, and this is going to be applicable to more of like the clinician who has a brick and mortar mm-hmm. is that let's say you're a naturopath, for instance, and you have a brick and mortar practice, people walk down the sidewalk and they're like, oh, cool naturopath. I'm going to walk in the clinic and there you go. So you got people fall in your lap. Yep. regardless of what you know from marketing or business side of things. So I say like a lot of health professionals become successful in spite of themselves because mm-hmm. when you have a practice or even a gym, for instance, people literally just like fall through the door. Right. When you go online, that never happens. Like no one is finding your websites because the field of dreams online doesn't exist. There are more than a trillion pages of content on Google. You're not going to get found, right? So you can play the blogging. I'm going to build my website game. And I did that on my previous business. We built it to 1.4 million visitors per month. It took us 10 years to get there and $35,000 a month in editorial payroll. And we were blogging two to three times a day with five to 10,000 word articles. Wow. So if you're publishing a blog post once a week, you're it's like you're spitting in the ocean expecting to create a tidal wave. It's never going to happen. Don't even Don't even bother writing it. So there's so many things that, listen, like there's no, it's not that something's good or bad. I think there's just faster, smarter paths than others. So my first business was almost for the first seven to eight years exclusively built on content. So a ton of YouTube, a ton of blogging, and just a massive amount of like activity. Like there was just no rhyme or reason to what we're doing. And it took us a very long time to get traction there. Eventually, we built our YouTube following to 300,000 subscribers, but it took me 10 years to do that. So for a health coach who just gets certified, who's starting to shoot videos and put them on YouTube, if you want to make any kind of decent living in the near future, that stuff is it's not going to happen. Like It's not going to happen. And I think the only platform organically that you can maybe still get some traction on from day zero is TikTok. And that's slowly but surely going away because TikTok's ad platform is becoming bigger now. And in case you guys have been living under a rock, here's how it goes. You get on a platform like Facebook or Instagram and they're free. So if they're free, you're the product. Right. What that means is they're amassing eyeballs then that are selling it to advertisers who are then going to place ads in front of you. This is 100% going to happen on TikTok. It's 100% going to happen on the next social platform. So Instagram seven years ago is kind of what TikTok is now. So if you want to get on that bandwagon and do those videos, that's great. But how do I find clients? Well, you you either find clients with grind and sweat equity and time, or you pay to find clients. And I have the luxury of having done both. So my first business was built largely on content, free sweat equity. It's not free. I mean, it's, it's like we paid a lot, but 
not paid traffic as such. Paid traffic, when we started Healthpreneur, I was like, all right, so I never want to build that kind of business again that we had. It's way too complex. We had hundreds of funnels, way too much nonsense happening. I'm going to do one thing only. I'm going to do it extremely well. And I'm going to look at how do I get in front of clients as fast as possible? And I looked, I looked back in my previous business and I said, what's one thing that we did that just every single time we did, it worked really well. And for me, it was a webinar because I'm like, I love teaching. And if I can use that to also convert people, that sounds great. And so Healthburner's whole business model is built on paid traffic to a webinar. And from there, people can book a call to speak with you. So a lot of obviously, there's a lot of nuances to make that work properly, obviously. However, the beautiful thing about this, and this is why I'm so passionate about this, is that most of our clients are not well known. Most of our clients are not nutrition celebrities. I mean, we've worked with a handful who are very, very well known, but most of our most of our clients are just very good at what they do. They have no social following in some cases. Some of them do. They you know, don't even have a website other than maybe their practice if they have one. And we're able to have them come in and help with their messaging, their positioning, et cetera. And at the push of a button, when they're ready, we can launch ads that get in front of their exact people. And within the space of a couple hours or a couple of days, they're enrolling clients. Cool. And that levels the playing field. Mm-hmm. And for us, that's how we teach all of our clients how to find clients. I mean, it's, you know, we've helped over 1,200 coaches and practitioners now, help them generate more than $217 million in their businesses with this process. And I'm not saying organic doesn't work. It just takes way longer to get what mm-hmm. you want to get. Yeah. So that's my answer to how to find clients is learn how to pay to acquire clients at a profit. And in order, the nice thing about when you do that is you no longer take your business like a little side hobby. Right. Right. Now because it's a legitimate business. Like, yeah. like I'm spending money. I need to know my numbers. I have to have my messaging dialed in. And that also helps all of your other marketing and, and all of your other business activities improve as well. That's right. So that's in a nutshell, our approach. I like that because to your point, it's like, I'm intentionally taking business steps here. So this is a business. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that that for you, you kind of looked at, at all the, the stuff you'd created and webinars really were where you shone. So your paid traffic drives to a webinar. Where else could, for example, paid traffic drive to? What have you worked on? With yeah, other I mean, so I was just on a call with some friends earlier and I said, We've been running the same webinar, obviously a couple iterations evolved of the first one for the past six years. And last year, I'm like, let me just test lead magnets. Let me just, because I we in my previous business, what we would do is on a blog, we'd have on our blog of like millions of visitors, we had like different branches. So we'd have like pillar pieces of content. So like interval training, intermittent fasting, and each one of those had a very specific lead magnet to that content. And then when people opted in, there'd be an upsell for $10 and then another upsell and then all that kind of stuff. So you could drive paid traffic to an opt-in page for a PDF download. You could drive paid traffic to a blog post and inform people and then retarget them or have them opt in there. But the thing that I've realized, and obviously there's different opinions on this. Some people say, well, if you want the best quality people, don't have them sit through a webinar because they don't have time. Mm-hmm. And I've not found that to necessarily be true because as an example, last year we, t- we tested 22 different lead magnets. So very short cheat sheet type of concise promised things, Facebook ad opt in on the thank you page, making an offer to book a call for a team. And the numbers were no better than our webinar. And then the mm-hmm. people we got on the phone, number one, the show up rate was just plummeted through the floor. And the caliber of people was a lot less than those who came f- through our webinar. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I've been saying for years is that I call this the, the conversion commitment conundrum. Everyone talks about high conversions, but as coaches, we want high committed, highly committed clients. Mm-hmm. So if you go to if you go to an opt-in page, whether it's a webinar, whether it's a, a cheat sheet, PDF, lead magnet, whatever. And you ask someone for their first name, their last name, their phone number, their email, their mailing address, your conversion is going to be very, very low. You're asking for a lot of mm-hmm. commitment mm-hmm. just on the opt-in. Right. Now, on the flip side of that, if you just ask for the email, you'll have way higher conversions. Mm-hmm. But if someone gives you all of that information, they are a much better qualified prospect yeah. than someone who just gives the email. 
So I don't suggest getting all that information. So we ask for email, in some cases, first name, email. However, when you look at a webinar versus like a one-page download, uh, like a cheat sheet or a, a lead magnet, the difference is people commit with their money and their time. So mm-hmm. when you offer a lead magnet, there's no time involvement. It's just like, I'm a, and what's funny is actually we've statistically seen this in my previous business because we had dozens of lead magnets. Someone would request it and less than 50% of them would actually download it from the first email they got with the download link. Mm-hmm. So then I was like, what's the point of doing this? And so when you look at a webinar, you're asking people to sit through 30, 45, 60 minutes And some people are like, I'm too busy. I don't have time for this. Really? How many hours of Netflix have you watched in the past week? Right? We all have time for things that are a must. So the nice thing about a webinar is that it it, it filters away those people who talk a big game, but are not committed to the end results. And so the people who do watch a webinar are only going to watch until the end if it's a must, right? They're like, I'll get to the point five minutes in, they're gone. They're not committed in the first place. So it helps you as a coach filter away a lot of tire kickers and people who would have wasted your time otherwise if you just had to book a call button on your website, right? Or if they just came in through a lead magnet and took it from there. So you have a little bit lower conversion, but you have higher commitments, which means a higher quality prospects. And I think that's something that we all want if we're spending our time talking to people. I'd love your opinion here in terms of paid ads versus organic marketing. And for, is there a difference and a different recommendation for folks that are literally just starting versus folks that are a few years in and they're looking to grow? So that's yeah. that's my first question. But then in addition to that, in terms of choosing what you're going to drive that traffic to, in terms of the cost for that ad, is it does it turn out to be a wash in the end in terms of who actually buys in terms of lower quality but more people and in the end you have these people versus yeah. maybe a, a lower um, conversion but better committed and, and at, at the end of the day what is the cost of acquiring that client with those approaches? Sure. So the first question is you know baseline if you're starting out is it a different strategy if you're further along? So most people. We'll say if you're just starting out, you shouldn't run paid ads and start doing 20, 30, 40, 50K a month. I'm like, dude, how's that happening? Mm-hmm. How are you getting to that level of revenue right. in the near future organically? Right. So my approach is the opposite. I'm like, learn how to do paid traffic from day zero. And then once you have a system that's working for you relatively consistently, then you can start building your brand through paid or through um, more of the organic content stuff. Everyone's talking about being an influencer, like influence. And listen, like if you've got 10 million followers, it's going to help your business. I I don't, I'm not arguing with that. My approach is build your income first, then your influence. Because when you look at the most influential people, let's look at The Rock as an example. What a lot of people look at is they're like, oh, The Rock has, I don't even know, like 50 million followers on Instagram. But what they don't, think about is that that's not where he started. He started Mm -hmm. off as an underpaid CFL football player who was dead broke Mm -hmm. and then became a wrestler and then became, you know, a Hollywood actor, et cetera. So he had to earn his income. He had to earn his way, his earn his right to become a person. Number one, that obviously was making money. And then in that process became more influential. And that took him, that's like a 20 plus year process So naturally, obviously, when he goes on social, he's going to crush it relative to if he had started on Instagram as a dead broke football player 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And this is what people don't understand is they they look at, you know, the the celebrities of the Internet world. And a lot of them have a big focus on social now, but most of them didn't start there. They built businesses that were different from what they're currently doing, and that became help them become who they are now to become more influential. Mm -hmm. So my approach with our clients, first and foremost, is whether or not they want to become an influencer is irrelevant. What they do want is to make money and to help people. So it's like, let's do that first. Let's help you earn 10, 20, whatever it is a month. And then if you want to start adding on the content stuff on the back end, now that you have a system that's largely working on your behalf, and you've got more time back, then sure, pick a platform if you want to. You don't even, I mean, we didn't do, anything on social for three years when I started a health burner. Mm-hmm. Two of my clients were like, dude, 
you should really be on Instagram. And I'm like, nah, I don't want to take pictures of my lunch every day. Yeah. (laughs) And I was like, just maniacally focused on doing one thing extremely well. And so in the past, you know, two and a half, three years, we started to, you know, put more emphasis on the content side, but that's because we have the team, we have the bandwidth, we have the resources. And for us, I don't care if anything happens from our content marketing for the next 10 years, because like our YouTube channel has 3,700 subscribers. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I'm building our YouTube channel for 10 years down the road. Yeah. Yeah. But if I had to start from scratch, I was like, oh my God, this video has to be the one. I'd lose myself. I, I, I wouldn't be able to sleep properly. So I think, and again, this is very contrarian to what most people say. It's mm-hmm. like, hey, start organically. It's less risky. You're never going to make your time back. Right. Yeah. You're never going to make your right. time back. You can make your money back. Yeah. Learn how to do it properly. And I'm not saying do paid traffic on a whim. Learn how to do it properly because it is absolutely game changing. When you can go from zero to six figures in the space of a couple months, it, like there's no other vehicle that allows you to do that. Yeah. So the second question I think you asked was around, you know, kind of moving people from like a lower end product or like to potentially higher end, like what is the cost yeah. of the client? And so this really comes into like how much friction is involved in gaining that client. So you're qualifying, which is awesome. And with yeah. someone with limited time, they don't want to waste their time on a bunch of stuff. But at the end of the day, I'm also trying to economize my dollar and where I'm spending it. Yep. At the end of the day, does it turn out to kind of be a wash, even though you've got a lot of leads? You know, so that, that's, I guess, my question in, in terms yeah. of your thoughts there. So naturally, if you're, so my recommendation, if you're running paid ads, I don't think you should run paid ads for anything less than $2,000 in terms of your program cost. So mm-hmm. like in terms of what it would cost someone to work with you. Right. So if you're selling a course for $197, it's going to be very hard to make that happen profitably. Um, and then you have to run a business where you're, you're losing on the front end, And then three months down, down the line, you're breaking even. Yeah, It's not fun. It's not fun to do that. And that's a large part of what we did in our previous business uh, was running stuff on paid traffic eventually at $47 on the front end or free plus shipping offers and then spending months in the negative and then breaking even mm-hmm. afterwards on the back end. And then yeah. you got to promote everyone else's stuff just because you have to make up the numbers. It was, it's crazy. It's nonsense. So our clients are all selling higher end coaching programs, right? So they're all health professionals to just, you know, in some cases, $7,000 in that, in that, in that, in that range. And it's what I found is like, it is just as much work to sell something for $5,000 as it is $5. Mm-hmm. We have people saying like, I've got a membership site. Uh, we have a, some, someone asked me this question and she's like, I have a membership site, uh, 27 bucks a month and a coaching program, right? What should I do? Like, where should I divert my energy? I asked her, I'm like, how many people do you have in the membership site? She's like, I've got like 20. I'm like, kill the membership site, yeah. like, blow it up. And then she's like, well, I spent all this time developing it. Well, that's great. Well, you can go down with a sinking ship <laughs> or you can take that content and just put a couple of zeros behind it. And now it becomes your coaching program. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so the thing is you have to like, you have to understand there are a lot of people say a customer is a customer, right? Someone who spends a dollar with you is just as valuable as someone who spends $20,000 with you. And I've never seen that to be true <laughs> because I, I, I mean, I, I don't like, I understand there's a big difference between an, a lead and someone who pays you money, but there's a very big difference between someone who spends a dollar with you and someone who spends $20,000 with you. It's not the same person. And what a lot of the digital marketing teaching has been for since the beginning of time has been get people in for cheap and yeah. then ascend them over time. And eventually they'll turn into high paying clients. Okay. So what's the thinking behind that? The thinking behind that is people will spend more money with you over time if they trust you, mm-hmm. which makes sense, right? hundred percent. So if we ask a different question, how can we bridge, how can we time compress that trust building without having to spend months or years for them, you know, to buy a $1, $10, $47 product to how do we give them the actual solution? Because the other way of thinking about this is no $47 ebook is the end all solution, right? If you have a migraine headache, it is a disservice to the person you're serving if you give them one tenth of the pill. Mm-hmm. They want the full pill. They want the full. So pill. what I what I love about coaching is that so for us, we have our main coaching program and there's nothing else underneath it because from our perspective, even if we were to give like a DIY light version of it, 
most humans do nothing on their own. Right. And that's like, it's not, a, it's, it's just the way it is, right? Why we have a job. Yeah. Why coaches Statist- exist. Statistically, 10% of people who buy a course finish it. And that doesn't even speak to the success rate of the results. Mm -hmm. So philosophically for us, we want to help our clients make more money, help more people, have more freedom. That's never going to happen by selling something for a hundred bucks or a thousand dollars. We're like, you work with us at the highest level. We are going to support you every step of the way. And we will be an extension of your business pretty much. Otherwise there's nothing else. And we understand that some people, so for us, it's, it's that and everything else is free. So we give away our best stuff. Like I just, I give away everything on YouTube, everything in our Facebook group. And I'm like, whenever you're ready, either financially, or if you've been enough pain and you're ready to start now, here's where we go. And so for us, instead of going like $10, $40, $100, and eventually it's like, (laughs) here's the coaching program. And if, if it's not a fit now, that's fine, but you can, you can consume our content for the next couple of years if you want to. So it, it's kind of an ascension model, but everything's free up until the main the main program. Wow! And that for us has worked well because it allows you to fill your cup. Mm-hmm. You can't fill your cup with fifty dollars clients. Yeah, right. And I think I call this the healer's dilemma. Like a lot of health practitioners and coaches want to help everyone. Oh, well, they can't afford it. I'm going to drop my prices. Right. And I had um, this drove me nuts a couple of years ago. Someone had posted in one of our in our Facebook group. And she's like, uh, hey, guys, I'm looking for support. And, and she was like a healer of some kind. She lived in California. She was like, I need to move my son and I out of California. We can no longer afford to live here. Oh, boy. And then in the PS, just remember that Facebook takes a 3.5% fee off any donation you make. And I was like, really? I'm like, you, you are forced to leave your state because you have not been able to learn how to make money. That is a travesty. And that is why no one is being helped if you can't help yourself. So right. yeah, that's that's my answer to that question. That's great. It's a lot. So it's it's so good. And uh, I actually really like how emphatic you are about this. I There's zero wishy-washiness here, which I'm greatly fond of. It's an exciting time to be a health coach. Scientists are uncovering the mysteries of the human microbiome. We're now gaining clarity into complex gut health issues we didn't even know about a decade ago. This means it's also a great time to become a gut health expert. Primal Health Coach Institute's Human Intestinal Microbiome in Health and Disease Specialist Certification is for health coaches who want to help people heal the root problems of many of their health symptoms and conditions. A recent survey spanning 73,000 people across 33 countries found that nearly 40% of adults suffer from a gastrointestinal disorder. As an expert in gut health, you can offer unique programs and services to clients looking to manage or reverse a diagnosis such as an autoimmune disease, irritable bowel syndrome, or type 2 diabetes, or those who wish to improve their overall health. Gut health expert, cardiologist, and best-selling author Dr. William Davis teaches you everything you need to know about the human microbiome, including coaching tips to give you the confidence and credibility to support your clients and help them heal their guts, sleep better, gain more energy, and enjoy stronger immunity, balanced mood, smoother skin, and more. Find out more about how to become a gut health expert. Visit PrimalHealthCoach.com. So, so you mentioned a second ago that you, you work with your clients and and help them do everything because it feels like there's a lot of moving parts here. Like, for example, first of all, your product has to be $2,000 or more, right? So Mm -hmm. maybe you've got this health coach coming in with a thousand dollar product. It's like, help me out. And you're like, first things first, we have to get your product to a 2000 to $7,000 price range. So do you help, do you help the, the coach, like figure out how to facilitate that so that they have the thing the thing to sell that then they can put the paid advertising behind. And do you help with then the like nurturing the leads? And like, do you help? Because what I heard you say is that you, you, you know, learn how to do paid ads. If you learn yeah. how to do paid ads, but what if we don't want to learn how to do it? We just want somebody to do it for us. Like we're- well, I have, I have some, some even more shocking advice on that, which I can share in a second, but so just answer your first question. So we help on, on the two biggest concerns, which is acquisition and delivery, right? So how do I find clients? Cool. And how do I deliver an amazing transformation to them online, right? Whether that's one-on-one or a group program. 
with a, a lot of a lot of people think that the more I charge, the more stuff has to be in my program. Right. And that's actually backwards because something's more valuable if it's easier and faster to t- faster to results. Mm-hmm. So if you can, the most important thing around pricing is in here. Why, why, okay, so if you're at a thousand dollars, why not just make it two thousand dollars? Right? Is there like a the course police who says, you know, no, this has to be uh 1700 based on the quality of the content? No one, there's no product police, right? It's it's ultimately going to come down to the client. I don't think most health professionals are looking to pull a fast one over on people, right? So I think the benefit of charging more is that it forces you to look at your own stuff and be like, I need to do this again. This one specific video is is pretty crappy. Mm-hmm. I'm going to reshoot that. Or I, I need to make this more clear because the benefit of premium pricing is that your clients show up so they get the results. Oh, yeah. But it also forces you to be better because you're not going to look like an idiot selling something for two, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000. That's garbage. Mm-hmm. And so if that's the case, then it's better for the client as well. So, but it all starts up here. And I tell my clients, I'm like, find a price where you feel 100% convicted that it's a steal. So if it is a thousand dollars and that's where you are to start, that's fine. Just understand your margins are going to be tight. If you can get to a couple yeses, bump it up to 1500. If you can get a couple more yeses, bump it up to 2000 and then just keep going like that. It's hard to go from a thousand to 7,000, right? Like obviously I'm not suggesting that. So that's kind of on the pricing piece. And then, um, Oh my God. The second piece, um, paying someone to do it for you. Yeah. Learning. That's right. This is the yeah. biggest mistake, the <laughs> biggest mistake in the health industry. I've got more stories than we have time to share here. Um, a lot of, a lot, again, a lot of people in our space, they just want to teach, right? They want to work with their clients and all that kind of stuff. But here's the cool thing is that if you like doing that stuff, all of that's marketing, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like this right here is marketing. I'm just sharing my beliefs, right? That's yeah. all this is. And I just do the same thing with my clients. It's just behind a paid gateway. That's the only difference. I have seen so many health professionals lose tens of thousands, in some cases up to $250,000 on marketing people, agencies, VAs who didn't know what they were doing. In fact, uh, so when I started Healthpreneur almost six years ago, I ran all of our ads, built it up to seven figures. And then I was like, cool, you know what? I'm going to focus on other things. I'm going to hire this out now. So for the past five years, we worked with three different agencies. Some of the top agencies work with Tony Robbins, the biggest of we're paying retainers of $20,000 per month Hmm. plus ad spend. So in retainers alone, we had spent more than over, I think it was $520,000 in five years. And at the end of last year, I just started asking questions like, what the hell is happening with our uh, with our numbers here? Like we were paying $80 a lead. Yeah. I'm like, this is insane. And the numbers mm-hmm. just kept going up. When I was running ads myself, they were like 20, 25 bucks a couple of years ago. And I was like, oh, maybe it's just the market's changing. Things are more expensive. Uh, but earlier this year, I said, you know what? F this, I'm bringing everything back in house. I took full control of our ad accounts again. I rebuilt, you know, I looked at, like audited the whole account, broke it apart, and I started running everything myself. Within 45 days, we decreased our cost per acquisition. So cost per lead, cost per client, cost per, sorry, cost per call book, cost per client by 60%, which allowed us to triple our ad spend in a month and a half after working with the best ad, ag- ad agencies for five years. And I was like, how much money have we left on the table? Mm-hmm. And it just, it was, it was driving me bonkers. It would be like, Hey, here's a new ad. Can we get this launched four days later? Is this live yet? When we brought everything back in house, now we have a team member who runs this stuff. It's like done in four hours, mm-hmm. right? Not four days, regardless of ad agencies, no one, no one, no one is going to know your messaging as well as you do. Okay. You had you have to know your audience. There is one thing no one can delegate, and that's your messaging, yeah. at least for the first couple of years in your business. Like I still do the messaging in our business. It's so, so important because no one understands how to articulate what's in here. No one understands how to connect with your prospects and clients and your audience as well as you do. And do not expect someone else to figure that out, no matter how much you pay them. At least initially, I would say until you're at like multiple seven figures and you want to start building a bit of a marketing team, that's fine. But for the first million or so, you have to, have to, have to do your marketing. It is the number one skill 
because it builds, it gives you the capacity to always earn money and always attract clients and always be able to fill up your cup in the service of other people. Mm. Yeah. You know, so I would love to flush that out a little bit because I, I would love to, for I don't know, can you pinpoint what it is? I mean, certainly you took the reins, but what do you think you were doing differently than this ad agency was doing? Is it the fact that this ad agency is working with a bunch of people and you're just one account versus you, it's all in? Or did was there, did you notice different trends? Because we see this happen in the school side where we've gone from you know, um, agency to agency where the cost of ads skyrockets and they blame it on everything but their own work. It's blamed yeah, totally. on, yeah. So I would love your thoughts there, if you don't mind sharing your experience. Yeah. So when you have fractional attention, you get mm -hmm. fractional results. Mm -hmm. And we had outsourced a few different areas of our business to different agencies, uh, not just on the ad fronts. And every single time it was like shit results. Like yeah. how, how much longer are we going to put up with this? And that's really what it came down to. So we brought everything back in house. And basically as a rule of thumb, we're no longer working with agencies <laughs> like into the near future. I'm like, I, you can't sell me on why I'm going to work with an agency anymore. Second thing is that none of them want to work based on performance. So the, mm -hmm. the second agency that we worked with, I said, okay, guys, so like here's, I would, I would love to pay you more than the retainer. So why don't we set up a performance-based compensation where you get paid based on performance, i.e., cost per call booked, number of calls booked. And they're like, ah, oh, you know, we've done that before and it didn't work out too well. <laughs> For them. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and then, uh, well, I was, the, I was the idiot in that case because it didn't work out too well for me. Mm -hmm. So when, when people are incentive, when, whether they're an agency or not, when people in a performance-based role, which pretty much is every role, to be honest, are only, are not even incentivized based on performance, then they can get away with just the status quo. Yeah. There is no sleepless nights. There is no, unless there's someone who just is obsessed with producing the best possible results, which, you know, might exist. But when it's not your own money, when it's not your own business, you don't care. It's like having a financial advisor run, like uh, run all your own um, asset management stuff. Mm -hmm. They're going to have an interest, but not as much as you will, because it's your money. And the same thing with business is I'm not saying you have to do everything yourself because I certainly don't. Mm -hmm. But there is a massive difference between bringing people in-house, whether it's part-time or full-time, in terms of their attention and focus on the results. Mm -hmm. And that also goes into how you can compensate people, right? Based on performance. Mm -hmm. Like our in-house media buyer now, he has a base and he's incentivized based on specific KPIs that we've set. So he knows if certain things aren't being met, he needs to lose sleep at night. Right. right. He needs to have ownership over those results as opposed to just being like, ah, whatever happens, I'm still getting my flat fee. Yeah. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges is that there's no, there's no skin in the game. Right. Is this, this, they have, you're okay. one of 50 clients. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's one thing. And I just want to, cause you could also say, well, it's similar if you're, you have a coaching business, right? Like you have, we have, we have more than 200 clients at the moment. And you could say, well, well, what's the difference there? Well, the difference in a coaching relationship is the client does most of the work. Right. In an agency, they're doing most of the work. Mm -hmm. That's a very big difference. For an agency to have high-level execution and ideation across 50 businesses is very hard relative to a coaching program that has 50 clients. Because mm -hmm. in a coaching program, one of the reasons I love it is that most of the onus is on the client which is mm -hmm. what it should be, right? It's like right. you get the results based on what you put in. Yeah. So I think that's part of it. And the second part of the agency side is that the brains is not the executor. That's mm -hmm. correct. So the last agency we worked with, I, I fell in love with the CEO. This guy was one of the smartest guys I have ever heard speak on Facebook, Facebook advertising. And I was like, we're going to work with this guy. And he's still a good friend. He's amazing, but his team sucks. And his team was running our ads. Yeah. And that was the problem. And that's, I, there was just way too many things that fell through the cracks. And that's just, that's sad. So it is. Yeah. I, I'm feeling so triggered because I worked at a large, <laughs> large agency before I packed it in to do health coaching. And, and I was thinking about an anecdote where I went to a conference and I, I ran into this thought leader that I just am obsessed with and I, I, everything they put out, I devour. And I ran up and I said, Oh, I'm so excited to meet you. I really love that, that, um, that ebook you put out last week about such and such a thing. And this person had no idea what oh, I was no. talking about. 
had no idea what to talk about. I was I was just immediately like out of fan mode. Like, oh, yeah. I I I hung I hang on your every word, and it turns out they're not even your words. It was such a weird, disingenuous experience. Mm-hmm. It was very jarring. They say like never meet your idols, right? Something yeah. like that. Oh my gosh. So, I mean, so th- this is so fantastic in terms of what I'm hoping coaches listening take away is um, prioritizing what is going to be the most important thing to actually drive your business. Everything else you can outsource, right? Um, but but really just so the, the quality of your product and what it is you're delivering, your own messaging, and then driving who's hearing that message needs to kind of come from you. Yep. And kind of figure that out from a priority standpoint. So we've talked a lot about acquisition. I really want to make sure we have time to get into the actual delivering of the product, you know, from a coaching perspective. Yeah, totally. I'd love, so, to know, I'd love to know what your point of view is in terms of like one-on-one coaching versus group coaching. Because I feel like I've seen you kind of talk uh, on your social feed about like, don't do one-on-one, you're trading time for money. But a lot of coaches like to hang on to that piece. Yeah, I mean, totally. What do you think? <laughs> I have some thoughts on that for sure. So just to answer your question um, real quickly, Laura. So when you're starting your business, you're good. So assuming you have the tools to produce a result for a client, right? Even if it's one-on-one, you have to understand that your products, like your service, your ability to help someone is good enough to produce a result. Mm -hmm. But what you don't have yet is any clients. So what you have to focus on for the first quarter of a million dollars to half a million is exclusively sales and marketing. That's it. You have to understand that what you're delivering is good enough, but it's not the best it's ever going to be. And it never will be because you're only ever getting a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But there's no sense in making the world's best product if no one knows about it. So it's this, it's kind of a balancing act initially where you have to get clients in to pay you money. But at about, I would say, and again, depends on the nature of your business, but generally around the half a million to three quarters of a million mark, you as the owner of the business, assuming you have support, maybe you have a client concierge, maybe you have someone who's now supporting you perhaps on your enrollment calls, you can start to focus a little bit more attention on the products, on the delivery. Because in, in the long run, that is the most important thing. Yeah, It's something I obsess about. It, like it is, I, I think of um, Walt Disney and being able to create a Walt Disney, like a Disney-like experience for your clients. And, but I think a lot of a lot of coaches get hung up on it's got to be perfect, and mm-hmm. it never will be perfect. Like even the iPhone, I have an iPhone 10, and then there was the iPhone 11, I think, and then the 13, and then the 14, and there there's going to be iPhone 150 at some point. Yeah. There's never the perfect thing; they just keep getting better. So if you understand that you're good enough as it is right now, and if you're not, well, skill up, but understand the difference between that and self-doubt that you have to start on the marketing side. But when you get to focus a lot on the product, like right now, over the past two months, I've like my team and I on the delivery side, have just been obsessed with almost to a level that is, um, it, it almost seems bureaucratic. Like, you know, when they talk about like big companies and the, like the five levels of decision-making and board approvals, That's kind of what we've gone through in the past two months with every single piece of our program. This training, it's too long. Can we get it shorter? Okay, it's confusing people here. Can we cut this out? Can we make like every single thing we've just gone and we're still going through this process over the next month. And it's so exciting for me because this is something that we do not like every couple of years, but it's based on how we see our clients winning, struggling, where they're getting stuck. And you can't make an amazing product without feedback from your marketplace, specifically people paying you money. Yeah. So I think the product is everything. Like it really, really is everything. And if you're marketing, and I think where marketing gets a bad rap is marketing amplifies whatever it's selling. So if you've got a shitty product, good marketing is just going to tell more people how shitty you are. But if you have an amazing product, I want to say product, I mean like coaching program, whatever it is. Great marketing amplifies that. And when you have good marketing with an amazing product, and if you have a long-term horizon of like 5, 10, 15, 25 years in the future, it's incredible what can happen. And I think that's one of the things too is is think longer term. Because if you think with a 15 or 20-year horizon, it doesn't mean you're going to take 20 years to make a million dollars. But it, it starts to it starts to get you thinking about like how amazing could this become? in the next decade, right? If we just made these small little improvements with more client feedback, 
it's just, it's incredible. And that's, that's how you start to, that's how you become the preeminent coach or player in your space yeah. is by this attention to these details. And I think it's honestly easier than ever before. I don't know about you guys. It's, it's very rare that I go to a restaurant, cafe, hotel, or frequent in airlines where I am blown away by the service, right. where I'm blown away by the experience. It's right. just mediocre at best. And it is so easy to be better just by focusing on the small details that no one else is paying attention to. I mm-hmm. think that's a major opportunity. I want to tie a bow on this because I want to get to Aaron's question about one-on-one coaching and group coaching. Yes. But I, you know, I heard you earlier maniacally focused on doing one thing really, really well. Right. Start there, right? Have a program, have something you can sell, which by the way, Aaron, thinking through this, Primal Pro is the answer to that right now. This is just something our, our program, like they have a program and it's a good program and it delivers good results. Boom, your product is done. Focus on selling the crap out of it, bringing people in, marketing that because your stamp is going to be on those one-on-one coaching calls, if that's what you're doing, or your Zoom group coaching calls, where you're really just bringing this to life and making it yours and delivering that just amazing experience to people that you can then turn around and perfect and signature and, and adjust things as you go. And then you get to the point where you're making more money than you ever thought you'd make. Now your vision is so much more than you ever started with. Um, and I, I mean, I just, I see how this really kind of all comes together here, but it, you all have to start at being really, really good at something maniacally focused on doing that and focus on bringing more and more people into it so that you have the ability to grow your, your Facebook ads. Gosh, I mean, if, if you're going to in, invest in kind of more sales quickly so that you have the, I guess, the luxury to get out and just give stuff away for free in terms of mm-hmm. content marketing. You know, it's it's a unique, it's it's a different approach than anything we've heard because we've had a lot of business coaches on this. I mean, how about it? Well, right, right, Aaron? Yeah. This is the first time we've really kind of heard this sort of, let's flip it on and, its head. And I think you're actually answering the question. Mm-hmm. You're like, you're actually answering the question. It's like, you have to declare a specialty and make a product. Mm-hmm. Then you're going to have to buy your first few clients, mm-hmm. in a matter of speaking, because nobody knows who you are. Because that's mm-hmm. the, that's the that's the that's the gap. It's like okay, I, I have this expertise, but where are the people? It's like they don't even know you exist. Exactly. Right. They have no idea you exist. So you're going to have to yeah. go and probably invest. Versus, how many people do we see who are like, I'm not successful yet. I should invest in another certification. Yes. <laughs> oh, another gosh. Because that's like, going to make the difference for sure. Right. Yeah. 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 It's like <laughs> the certification epidemic. <laughs> but going to your question, Aaron, about the one-on-one. And um, I, so listen, like I understand there's certain, there are certain issues that require maybe, a, or that merit more one-on-one. So for instance, if you're a therapist dealing with major trauma, sure. Mm-hmm. One-on-one, but also think like, just, I think it's interesting to ask better questions because I think the dilemma is that both the prospect and the coach in many cases believe that more one-on-one is better. So mm-hmm. some people would, you know, some clients might say, well, I think I just need more one-on-one or like, let's say you were selling a group coaching program and that's, that's an interesting thought. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. If I had, uh, if I could push a button on your head and you would get the results, or I could say, we'll spend an hour on the phone together every week for the next 12 weeks to get the result, which one would you rather have? I think most humans would say, we'll just push the button on my head and that's most that's obviously it's it's obvious. So unfortunately I don't have that capability, but what you're telling me is that you're more concerned about the result than how we get there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you trust that what I'm showing you here is the fastest, smartest way to get you to the result? And that's just the paradigm shift where it's like, well, I thought I needed more one-on-one one, one hour coaching sessions are the biggest waste of time. Um, I mean, I, I even like even as a trainer back in the day, my co- my my training, I was it was like hanging out instead of working out. Yeah, I'm like, so I started to to challenge my clients. I said, well, I know you've paid for an hour, but could we just train for 20 minutes? Because I, I don't like we don't need to hang out and talk. I mean, all of this nice and build relationships and so yeah. forth, but we would get just as much done and better results in 20 minutes than we would in 60. Mm-hmm. So I think the first thing is dissociating, especially from the coach's perspective, you have to dissociate the client's results from your time. Yeah. The, the two cannot be on the same on the same line. 
And I think part of this is, you know, when I say ask a better question, a question that I ask and that I, I challenge my clients to ask themselves is, what would have to be true for my clients to get the, the result that they want if I never spoke with them? Mm -hmm. I was like, huh. Yeah. So what would the curriculum have to look like? How good would it have to be to see every possible little issue that could come up, question, concern, uncertainty? How could you address that? And again, you're not going to know this right away. Like this is why it's important yeah. to work with clients so you see this stuff come up. But constantly asking yourself that question. And so if you've never worked with a client, sure, take on a couple one-on-one -on -one clients, but you don't need to spend the next 10 years doing one-on-one. -on -one. Like you'll see the same patterns over and over and over again. Yeah. So true. for me, I'm like, I don't think group coaching, sorry, I don't think one-on-one -on -one is more effective than group for most, whether we're talking about weight loss, skin issues, gut issues, any health issue other than deep emotional trauma, group is the way to go. No one, no one thrives better in isolation than in a community. Mm -hmm. right? We become our surroundings. And if you're in a community of like-minded individuals who are all moving in the same direction, who are positive, who are optimistic, who want good things, you're naturally going to become like that. Mm -hmm. And that's something that one-on-one -on -one coaching doesn't allow. It doesn't even provide. It's right. you and the coach. The second problem with one-on-one -on -one coaching is that you are tied intricately to the person who's coaching you. And if they're a friggin' disaster, your results are going to be a disaster. As an example, slight tangent, but related, we had a, a headhunting firm that we had hired a little while ago, and they just went out of business. We paid them $20,000 to place one person, and mm -hmm. they didn't do that for us. And unfortunately, we have no recourse because of the agreement set up, whatever. But when I started to look at this person on Facebook, the head of this company was an absolute shambles. Her life was a disaster. Oh and I'm like, well, it's no wonder your business failed, right? Like you're just, a, this is not good. So what I'm saying is if you are working with a coach one-on-one -on -one and that coach has a bad day, if they have a breakup in their relationship, if they get sick, if something happens to their parent, you're fucked, right? In our business, I'm not saying like our business is the be all and end all, but we have an amazing team of expert coaches. and. If I'm away for a week or if I don't feel good today, that has zero impact on my clients because number one, our curriculum is amazing and we have an incredible team of coaches. We offer up to seven coaching calls a day on the various nuanced aspects of the business model we teach. So I don't need to be the star of the show and I never want to be. So that's the difference. Like if you are looking for a one-on-one -on -one coach, you as the client, that's the dilemma you're going to run into. And also if you're looking to build your business, from someone who runs their business as a one-on-one -on -one coach, maybe not the best business mm -hmm. model to follow, but you as the coach, if you are taking on clients, you know, you're going to have major bottlenecks because yeah. you only have so much time. Burnout is the number one problem in our industry, yeah. uh, especially for people who've been in it for a long time. And so again, it's just, I call this the medical matrix. So obviously it applies to coaching as well. And it's very transactional. So you have one session, it's 50 bucks, 100 bucks, See you next time. Um, and it's not based on an outcome. It's not transformational. It's based on time. Yeah. And it's not effective. I mean, it, you know, it certainly can have its place. But if you, here's the solution. If you want to continue doing one-on-one -on -one in, in any capacity is offer office hours. So essentially office hours, the way I define it is you have a block of time that you determine works for your schedule. So let's say Friday is between 12 and 2. You block off 20 minute time slots. So you can offer six time slots, let's say on Fridays between 12 and two, and you allow your clients to book in during those times only. Mm -hmm. So now you've offered one-on-one -on -one if you want, and it's during a specific time frame that you have determined is good for you. And if you want to do more than one of those a week, you're more than welcome to. Um, but that's a much more effective way of still offering one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. if you're open to doing more of a leverage group coaching type of program so that people still feel like they're getting some one-on-one -on -one from you. But again, why do they feel they need that in the first place? Right. right? Like if I like if I'm doing a group coaching call of 20 clients, every single one of them has a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me. Yeah. So we're still one-on-one, -on -one, but just yeah. with a group. That's so the part that I can't through. wrap my head around. Yeah. Like that's the part where I struggle too. Cause every business coach I've ever hired said, Aaron, you gotta stop doing one-on-ones, get these people into groups. I'm like, but then they don't all get to like there's gonna be 15 faces on the Zoom call and that one didn't say anything. And then I feel like I've yeah. Let that person down. 
if you love one-on-one, do it, right? Like, I mean, maybe not exclusively, but I don't enjoy one-on-one. I'm not the best coach in a one-on-one type of setting. I'm better one to many. And I've, and I've known that for a long time Mm -hmm. and it's more energizing for me. So I wanted to build a business around what am I good at? What energizes me, but also with zero compromise to the client's results. Mm -hmm. So what happens in a group setting and like my calls will at the most have about, I'd say 20 people. I do them for an hour, three times a week. And then most of other coaches, the calls that they do, they might have five people on them. Okay. So it's a very manageable because we have, and again, we have, you know, a lot of calls, whatever, but even if you don't have a lot of calls that you offer, it doesn't matter because let's say you've got 20 people on a call. The key is how you structure it. So the first thing we do is I'll just get everyone to post a win in the chat. So I'll be like, type W with a win that you've enjoyed. So we start building momentum. So it's not like everyone's talking at the same time. Everyone's muted. They're popping wins into the chat. You read them aloud so everyone can recognize what everyone else is enjoying. Then we'll ask, okay, well, if you have a question you want support on, uh, be very specific in what that is and type it into the chat, starting with the letter S for support. So it'll be like S colon, and then the question. And then one by one, I'll go through, I'll open up their line. And I'm just doing my best to keep it, you know, five or 10 minutes per question, roughly. In some cases, you know, it's a lot shorter. But the nice thing is that every, like I do, I don't know if there's a single call that I've been on in the past several years where I've had to cut it off at an hour and people are like, I still have a question. I still have a question. Like I literally go around the table. I'm like, Laura, are you good? Is there anything you need help with? They're like, no, I'm good. Aaron, you good? Like we'll have people that show up on these calls just to listen in because of the benefit they get from everyone else's questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a beautiful thing about group coaching is that sometimes you may not want to ask the question, but someone else did ask the question you were thinking of asking. And now you benefit from the answer as well. And also with like a different way of saying the same thing is it's if the client doesn't even know what the question is they want to ask and somebody else has, has articulated it. And it was a question that never would have, you know, emerged in them. I think about that when I'm on one-on-one calls with my clients, like yeah. hopefully they asked all the questions they wanted to ask. Hopefully yeah. we didn't leave any stone unturned, but that's really because it's client led conversation. I have to assume that because they were ready to wrap up the call, they got everything they needed, but there might be things that don't, don't even know they needed. And yeah. I, I can see the absolute benefit in working through these groups. And it, you know, the more and more I hear it, the more I, I feel it is a really viable um, way of, because like, the observational learning piece is enormous. That's one of the ways that humans learn yep. many things well, yeah. observationally, right? So um, my, my question though, for you kind of along this line of building <clears throat> building businesses and whether you're going to go one-on-one or group or some hybrid model, all of the stuff we're talking about, I have a question about <clears throat> the mental bandwidth. Hmm. Mental bandwidth, but also actual bandwidth, time bandwidth, because I think a lot, a lot of health entrepreneurs, and I know you would know this, are are probably making a career move. Uh, maybe, maybe what, say fifty percent. I don't know. Most are making mm-hmm. a career move because, like all of us, we had this aha. We were like, "I'm done with working in marketing. I'm going to be a health coach." And so we always encourage people like, "Don't leap out of your." mortgage paying career. You still have to pay the mortgage while you're building this thing. Yeah, It feels to me a lot of times like to really get this stuff going, you'd have to be really putting in full-time days. And that is an absolute showstopper for somebody <laughs> like me or anybody who's holding down a full-time job while trying to build this on the side. So what's yeah. your take on that? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good point because a lot of people are in that situation. And I, I think all of us are at some point, like when I started transitioning online in 2005, I was working 16 hours a day with one-on-one clients in person. Right. And I was still underpaid at that at that point in time. But nonetheless, I'm like, okay, well, I can't just quit cold turkey because I have nothing coming in from the online stuff. I made $6,000 in my first year online. Like, you're not going to go very far on that. So what I decided to do was so, you know, I'm like in the gym and working with clients from 7 a.m. until like get home at 10 o'clock at night. So what I had to do was I just said, okay, I'm taking my lunch breaks and I'm going to lock myself in an office or go somewhere and just work on my stuff online. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference is what do you do with that time? That's the biggest mistake that I made when I started is that I had no direction and I was doing stuff that didn't matter. Mm -hmm. So with our clients, they're very clear. Like we, like it's a very systematic recipe like process. So like do this, then this, then this, And they're all doing the same sequence of things. When they've launched their, what we call a perfect client pipeline, the heavy lifting, if you will, is over. 
And I tell them at that point, there's only four things you're going to do to grow to a million dollars. That is going to be writing every single day, one page that can be used as an ad, can be used as an email, can be used as whatever it's messaging to your audience. The second thing is you practice your selling skills. You have to get better at communicating and influencing people. And obviously we have had scripts and blah, blah, blah. But if they're listening to their own calls and getting taking notes on what's working, what isn't, that's massively important. So between those two, we're looking at one hour. Second is look at your numbers and understand your metrics, especially when you're running paid traffic. That's going to be 10 minutes a day. And the final thing is add some type of value to your audience. So that could also piggyback on the first thing, which is if you write to your audience every day, that can be sent out as an email. It could be a social post. Four things, a total of two hours. That's it. Anything above and beyond that is your discretionary use of time. So we had a client who was like, she asked me this question. She's like, um, I'm just like, I'm working like eight hours a day on this stuff. I'm like, what do you, and this is after she had done the heavy lifting. I'm like, what are you doing for eight hours? Because there's only four things to do and they're going to take you two hours. Everything else is your choice. Like, I don't know what you're doing. So when, when we're transitioning from this corporate or something else to this business, to this future we want to build, Number one, we have to be very clear about we're not doing more stuff. It's about doing the right stuff. Mm -hmm. It's about taking stuff off your plate that is a complete waste of time. It's hard to know what that is, which Mm -hmm. is why it's very helpful to have a mentor who's paved the path before you because otherwise most of us don't know what the hell we're doing. That was my mistake for three years. I'm like, I'm smart. I can figure this out. (laughs) It'll work. So let's assume that you kind of know what to do. All right. So now you have at least some inkling of knowing what to do. Now, My advice is to, it's kind of a three-step process. So number one is you carve out at least one hour a day. And the easiest time to do that is first thing in the morning. Yeah. And and I was never, I was never like the early morning riser. It took me a long time to get there. Um, But I typically wake up anywhere between four and 4.30 every day. I have four kids and I work from home. But if you do one hour a day, seven days a week, Saturdays, Sundays included, it's like, if you think of waking up one hour earlier, that's 30 hours a week, sorry, mm-hmm. 30 hours a month times 12 months. That's 360 hours. That's like nine full-time working weeks. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Yeah. So you start by putting one hour aside, you make the time for that and you work on your most important stuff. It could be marketing, messaging, whatever. Then you're going to start to kind of get a little bit of traction with what you're doing online. And then maybe you can start to devoting a little bit more of a chunk of time during the day. So maybe you say that like Mondays will be marketing Mondays from I'm taking the mornings off from my other stuff. If I can, if you can, and then you just focus on that. Now, obviously if you're in a nine to five corporate thing, well, you might have to do some twilighting. You might have to work out, you know, a little bit earlier, whatever it is. Um, Again, in our case, we have practitioners who have a clinic or we have coaches who are leaving corporate. So in the corporate world, they're having to stay up a little bit later or they're working a little bit earlier in the morning for practitioners. What ends up happening or gym owners, they're like, I'm just taking Tuesdays off Mm -hmm. and I'm going to work only on my online business. So you move from kind of like this time allotment on a daily basis into chunking your week into let's say Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, I'll see people in person. Tuesdays and Thursdays and a little bit of time on the weekends, perhaps I'm going to build my dream and understand that this just part of it's just a season because eventually you're not going to have to work as much as you are now, Mm -hmm. but you have to, you have to, sow, you have to, or you have to, you have to plant the seeds and that's, that's kind of how it goes. You just have to, you have to make the time. Yeah. You're not going to fit it. And I think the easiest thing to do is either wake up earlier or dedicate lunch break or break time at some point during the day. Um, to get your work done and then start to throttle things in the opposite mm-hmm. direction as you have more traction uh, with your online business. That's great yeah. advice. Yeah. Take the time to build the bridge so that you've got something to cross rather than this sort of big leap. And speaking in terms of fitness professionals, so many of the fitness people I know have huge chunks of time in the middle of their day. Totally. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's at a random know. time. It's not like 11. 10 or 11, right? They they get clients early in the morning. Maybe they got people that come by at lunchtime and they got people in the evening, but you got these couple blocks of time that you can really focus on, on doing this. So, gosh, this was so valuable. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. it's fun. I love talking about this stuff. It's great. We can tell. We can tell. It, it feels pragmatic. I like yeah. a pragmatic approach. I, I honestly have, I've fatigued out of the ethereal 
approach to business <laughs> coaching. I need somebody to tell me what to do. Tell me to get up my ass out of bed one hour <laughs> well, earlier. <laughs> like, it's like, you know, it's funny though. Like, so my wife is very ethereal. I'm very pragmatic, but I'm also very aware of the power of energy. Yeah. So we have, we, we've worked with so many people that we will enroll someone and we can literally place bets on the table as to how they're going to do in their business hmm. based on their energy. So we have a client and this is actually a perfect fit. So she has a PhD in metaphysics. So when it comes to like law of attraction stuff, like she literally has a PhD in that stuff. And she is the most high vibe person I've met in a very long time. And I'm like, as soon as I met her, like we had a, we had a zoom call when she first came in and I'm like, this chick's going to crush this. And lo and behold, you know, she deploys her pipeline. She makes $15,000 in her first week and she's just flying. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, I share this because we, t- we have a very large energetic mindset component to what we do with our clients. We don't sell that obviously, because no one wants that. They want, I just want clients and money, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But what a lot of entrepreneurs don't understand is that all of the physical comes from up here. Mm-hmm. You can't attract and manifest things in your life if you're in fear, worry, self-doubt all the time. So as pragmatic as I am, I'm also a very tuned into, I mean, my license plate says vibrate high. That's, that's how important it is. So it's like you have someone who's doing the same thing, right? Same process, step by step, but they're getting very different results from someone else. Mm -hmm. What's going on there. And so we have to, like in many cases, there's conversations around, how are you showing up? What's the dialogue up here? What's your energy, right? Because if you have a lot of doubt, you're blocking all that stuff from coming into your life. And so it's a it's an amazing journey to go on as an entrepreneur compared to like a corporate job because you're forced to deal with this these demons, yeah. right? You're forced to deal with like, oh my God, what if people say no? Am I good enough? Should I be doing this? What if this doesn't work out? All of these different self-doubts and anxieties and all this kind of stuff, you have to grow through that because your business will only grow to the extent that you do. So the pragmatic piece, I agree with you, is very, very important. It's like you have to have the recipe, but you also have to really kind of, you know, keep your energy and vibration in check because that is a very, very big piece of the puzzle too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if if you, if you're, if you're burning the candle at both ends and you're just exhausted, what are you going to do when you are successful? (laughs) Exactly. I'll catch up later on. Like, no, you're going to be dead. Like, what's the point? You know, it doesn't work. Yeah. So tell, uh, you know, I, I'm sure after this um, episode, we're going to have a lot of people that want to know more about you and how they can follow you, absorb some of your amazing free content, but at the end of the day, hire you. I mean, I, I just think an investment in an investment in yourself and your own business. I've never, I've never, ever once regretted investing in myself. No, I might not have sense. gotten the value I expected, but I never, I never regretted investing in that. I always took something away from it. Yeah. So I love that. So tell people about where they can find you. Honestly, the best place, if you want to connect with me is on Instagram. I'm at healthburner one. So it's kind of like, if you want to just send me a message, that's the best Mm -hmm. place where I'll actually answer Mm it. Um, So at healthburner on Instagram. And if you want to just consume and devour hundreds of videos around marketing, sales, online stuff, mindset, uh, just watch my stuff on YouTube at healthburner, same handle. And again, like I give away everything, stuff we're doing in our business, stuff that's working, not working, very tactical stuff. So I think those are the the two best places probably. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was so great. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Aaron. It's been fun. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening.